So now we are going to start the first lecture on CMB by uh, Blake Shervy from Cambridge. All right, great. So thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. So I'm really excited to be back. I was uh, sitting in the audience for one of these uh, cosmology schools. I don't know when it was, 40 years ago or whenever I was a student. Um, and I really enjoyed it, so I'm really excited to be back. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> not that old. But it took a disturbingly long amount of time for people to realize that that's not true. <laughs> right, so I'm going to start us off by talking about the cosmic microwave background. And let me start by giving just a brief motivation for why you should pay attention during these lectures and why you should want to learn about the physics of the cosmic microwave background. So there's a huge list of regions why it's important to know about the CMB, and I'll maybe just sketch some of those. So in short, the CMB is our most powerful, arguably, and, and certainly our most robust probe of really interesting cosmology and really interesting physics. So the CMB is a beautiful probe of the history of the universe, right? It really shows you effectively the baby picture of the fluctuations in density and potential as they were early on. And you know from these sorts of fluctuations, all of the structure that we see around us today uh, grew. OK, so if you want to understand the history of the universe, the CMB is crucial. It's an image of the way the universe looked you know, very, very early on, right at the beginning. The CMB is also our arguably best way of figuring out what the universe is made of. So, you know, I'm sure you all know that 25% you know, of the universe is dark matter, 70% is dark energy, and 5% is baryonic matter. And these high precision numbers, to a large extent, come from the CMB. So it's an amazing tool for figuring out what the universe is made of. It's also, almost certainly, currently our most powerful tool for understanding the physics of the very early universe and testing uh, models such as inflation. And finally, the CMB is not just a great tool, a robust tool to understand cosmology, but it's also just a very, it's an amazing probe of fundamental physics, right? We've already talked about how it can probe the early universe, and as we'll talk about when we discuss B modes, you can access scales that would be impossible to probe with terrestrial experiments, you know, probing inflationary scares, scales that are a trillion times higher than the LHC, or particles that are so weakly interacting that you could you know, never see them uh, on a realistic experiment on Earth. So in short, the CMB is an amazing and robust probe of both cosmology and fundamental physics, and you, you should all learn how it works. Okay, So I will try to just start this topic in uh, these few lectures that I have here. So given that the audience is quite mixed, um, I should apologize to those of you who are real experts in the field of CMB, because I'm not going to assume that you've taken a course on uh, CMB before, and especially the first few lectures will be very introductory, um, especially this first one. Uh, but hopefully, you know, even if you do work on CMB towards the end, we'll cover some more advanced topics, such as uh, gravitational lensing of the CMB and CMB polarization. So hopefully those will also be interesting. And I should note, please feel free to just interrupt and ask questions. I might not be able to answer them all, but uh, it's more fun that way. All right, so <clears throat> what are we going to discuss in this course? Uh, today, I'll talk just about the very basics, right? What is the background CMB? Why is it amazing evidence that the hot Big Bang happened? And how do CMB photons propagate in our universe? And then in later lectures, I'll talk about the CMB power spectrum, uh, what it means, you know, how we can use it to learn about cosmology, uh, and later on, I'll discuss some more advanced topics. And there's, I've drawn from a very nice list of references uh, that I've noted here, and hopefully I'll make these slides available to you. And if you want to know more, you could look at Wayne Hu's amazing website, Anthony Challoner's lecture notes if you want to know a huge amount of detail, and uh, Daniel Bauman's new book has a nice summary of CMB physics as well. All right, let's get started uh, today with the, you know, the very basics. What is the CMB? And why is it an, a clear and unavoidable prediction that sort of proved that the hot Big Bang is indeed uh, the beginning of our, of our universe? So I'm sure you all know basic cosmology. You all know uh, that we've observed an enormous number of galaxies. 
And I'm, you all know also that Hubble discovered that these galaxies are all uh, running away from us. Um, and the further away these galaxies are, the faster they seem to be moving away from us. Right? And that's not because we're unusually repulsive, hopefully, but is instead interpreted today as the fact that space itself is expanding. And the more space that we have between two objects, the more it expands, and then the faster they seem to move away. Now, quantitatively, we can describe this, this observation as explained fully by assuming that the universe has the most general homogeneous and isotropic metric, the FLRW metric that I'm sure you're all familiar with here, right? And the distances here in this FLRW metric are rescaled with time by the scale factor A of t, as I'm sure you all know. And I will often be using conformal time eta because then I can draw nice space-time diagrams where light rays travel at 45 degrees, right? So dt is a d eta. That's the definition of the conformal time. Okay, now just reminding you further of some basic cosmology, I'm sure you all know this, uh, you can plug this metric into the Einstein equations which connect the geometry of the universe with the matter and energy content of the universe. And that gives you this connection between the scale factor A and what's in the universe. The density parameters omega lambda, omega matter, and omega radiation. Okay, and so that's a differential equation that tells you how quickly the universe is expanding as a function of what's in it, right? And so if you're, just to remind you, the scale factor is growing as t to the one half during radiation domination, t to the two thirds during matter domination, and later exponentially. And as I said, we'll often use conformal time. And I'll, with it, when I don't say anything, I'm going to be assuming flat lambda CDM, and I'm going to set, I use natural units where c equals one. In any case, what we see is that the scale factor grows with time. All distances grow with time. And therefore, it's a clear prediction of the standard hot Big Bang model with an FLRW metric that at early times, if we run that picture in reverse, the scale factor has to have been very small and every, you know, all distances were really small and everything must have been really close together. The universe must be extremely dense at early times. Now, you can easily show, and we will actually show this later, that the temperature of a photon is proportional to the energy to a photon is proportional to one over the scale factor. So at early times, when the scale factor was really small, therefore the temperature was huge, okay? So the early universe was incredibly dense and incredibly hot, and that's crucial for the emission of the CMB, All right? So just the standard hot Big Bang picture predicts clearly an extremely hot and extremely dense universe. And in fact, if I go to early enough times, the universe has to be made up of a plasma an incre incredibly dense and hot plasma, okay? So that, at the beginning of the universe, that's what you have in this standard hot Big Bang uh, picture. What do I mean by that? Let's go into a little bit more details. So at just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, you know, very close to the beginning, the universe is so hot that you have you know, that atoms are not, are not bound, and I have a plasma made up of uh, protons, electrons, and photons. Okay, so the electrons and protons are not bound, and everything is just flying around. Now, the photons rapidly scatter. Okay, and they rapidly scatter, in particular, off of the electrons. Does anyone know why they mainly scatter off the electrons and not the protons? That's right. So if you look at the Thomson cross-section, it was a factor of one over mass squared, and so the, the scattering with protons will be suppressed uh, quite heavily. So they mainly, the photons mainly scatter off of the electrons, but the, the, the protons obviously are affected by this as well because through sort of Coulomb interactions, they sort of scatter with uh, the electrons in turn. Okay, so that state persists for some time. Early universe is this glowing hot plasma of photons, electrons, and protons. I'm neglecting some helium, which is a small number of, of, of uh, nuclei. But then what happens is the universe, of course, expands and it cools off. 
And eventually, a terribly named process called recombination happens, which is that the universe becomes so cool that electrons and protons can come together and form hydrogen. Now, because the photons were scattering so rapidly off the free electrons in the early universe, the early universe was basically opaque. You couldn't see through it. Through it. The mean free path was really short. But now, after recombination, I said it's a terrible name because this is the first time protons and electrons combine to form hydrogen. After recombination, the universe is neutral. The scattering is much, much, much weaker. Maybe you have a tiny bit of Rayleigh scattering, but you can neglect that. And the photons will just free stream through the universe all the way until they reach our telescopes. OK? So that's sort of the basic picture. Uh, Again, to just summarize this, you know, hydrogen forms very quickly at a temperature of around 0.3 electron volts from uh, free electrons and protons. And before recombination, you have lots of Thomson scattering. The mean free path is short. And then the universe is neutral. Photons free stream to us. All right, are there, just to show you a really terrible illustration of this process, you can see these photons in blue bouncing off the electrons in green and the protons are doing very little. Uh, but then the universe cools, neutral, the hydrogen forms, and then the photons travel in an extremely unphysical picture where we can fly along <laughs> with, uh, with the photons. So you all know that you cannot do this, right? Uh, but the photons then travel uh, through the universe to us. So I like how you know when people try to make PR images, they sort of ex tell you as many wrong things as correct things. OK, are there any questions about the very basic picture? And then we'll get a little bit more quantitative. Uh, yeah? Where can I get that animation? I think it's made by the sort of Plonk PR team. So you should just look at like Plonk PR videos or something. And they'll make them. <laughs> there, there are other, I've cut out some other funny things that the photon does in the middle, which are also not, <laughs> not correct. Um, yeah. OK. so. Let's now get a little bit more quantitative in terms of when recombination happens and when the photons get released uh, and stream through the universe, okay? So you can do a pretty good job by just assuming that this process of electrons and protons forming neutral hydrogen is in thermal equilibrium. That's not gonna give you an exact answer. To get an exact answer, you have to use the Boltzmann equation for this process and you know, consider the details where you have a three-level atom and there's lots of, it's actually quite complicated to get this exactly right. But you get a good answer if you just assume everything is in equilibrium. And you probably know that in equilibrium, in thermal equilibrium, we can predict the equilibrium number densities of the electrons, the protons, and the hydrogen. Okay? And so I will have you do this as an exercise, but if you, write down those expressions for the number density in equilibrium. Those just depend on a sort of Boltzmann factor, which contains the mass and the chemical potential over the temperature. And if you want to know how ionized the universe is, in other words, how many free electrons there are versus electrons that are bound into neutral hydrogen, you can write down the free electron fraction Ne over Nb, or Ne over Np plus Nh. Okay, so when that free electron fraction is one, the, everything is a plasma. Everything is fully ionized. And when it's, when it's zero, then all the electrons are in hydrogen and the universe is neutral. Okay, and so as you will show, you can sort of plug in these expressions for assuming thermal equilibrium. And you can rearrange to get a nice equation for uh, the free electron fraction. So you know how ionized you know, and how versus how neutral the universe is as a function of a few, very small number of quantities. That's the amazing thing about thermodynamics. When things are in thermal equilibrium, everything just pops out from nothing. All you need to know is the temperature and the binding energy, mass of the electron, and this factor eta, which is the baryon to photon ratio. How many baryons do you have per photon? OK, and then what you can do is you can solve this. You can say, when does the universe recombine? When does this ionization fraction become really low? Okay, At what temperature? Because you know what the binding energy of 
hydrogen is 13.6 eV. You know everything else. We know this baron to photon ratio is 10 to the minus 9. And we can just plug in and solve. And naively, you would think, OK, the binding energy is 13.6 eV. Recombination has to happen roughly at a temperature of 13.6 eV. But instead, it gives a temperature of 0.3 eV. So does anyone know why it's so much lower than the naive answer? Exactly. Yeah. So there's so many photons that even those rare photons that are way in the tail of the Planck distribution, you know, rare, rare, exceptionally high energy photons are enough to ionize hydrogen and keep it ionized until the number density drops, uh, you know, way, way, way below 13.6 eV. Okay. So all these photons push that reaction to the left. Okay. Now, that's just when. That was a calculation of when the universe becomes neutral. And you've seen that we've done the Saha equation calculation in the dotted line. But a proper calculation agrees pretty well, at least for the onset of recombination uh, with this very approximate thermal equilibrium expression. Now, what we're interested, though, is when the photons get released. Because you know, that's sort of the cosmic microwave background, as we'll talk about in a second. And that happens when the Thomson scattering of these photons off the free electrons become inef becomes inefficient. And as you probably know, you can compute when a process, when a particle, a sort of scattering process becomes inefficient and when this particle freezes out by setting the rate of interaction to be equal to the Hubble rate, right? Because when that rate falls below the Hubble rate, then I, you know, don't even have one interaction per Hubble time. This process has basically stopped. OK, so if we, if we write that down for the photons scattering off electrons, what we find is that you know, because of this exponential cutoff, basically decoupling happens right after recombination. OK, so the electron density drops so quickly, recombination happens so fast that decoupling happens very soon afterwards. OK, and that occurs. And if you'd like, I can uh, walk you through the calculation at redshift 1100. OK, so that is basically when these CMB photons no longer scatter because all the electrons are bound into hydrogen and the photons can escape. One key point I want to emphasize is that this process is set by the local temperature. This is all just a, effectively a thermodynamic argument. And you get 0.3 eV just from you know, the binding energy of hydrogen and some sort of basic quantities like this. Okay, so the, at a fixed temperature of 0.3 eV, recombination happens, and then, photo, and then photons are released. Okay, so as an exercise, uh, if you haven't done this already, and I suspect many of you will have, uh, please just go through and derive the Saha equation. It's, it's worth your while. Um, and then I have a sort of quick question. Not a, for those of you who thought a little bit about CMB, so you always hear that CMB temperature and isotropies we measure in the sky, they probe the fluctuations in the radiation density that were there primordially. How can I square this with the fact that photons are emitted at a fixed local CMB temperature independent of the radiation density? Right? So it's always emitted at 0.3 eV. So how can I see the radiation density? How can I see the fluctuations in the radiation density in the CMB? Does anyone know? Th th that could be the answer, but it's, it's, it's not. There, there's some physics there also, yeah? Yeah, so the, there, the, you're right that there is, and we will talk about this. There is an effect where it climbs out of the potential, and that changes the, that changes the, uh, the temperature. But that's not the only effect. There's also something else. So even if the potentials were zero, you would see the variations in radiation density, even though the local temperature of emission is the same. Do a very good approximation. All right, we'll think about it and we'll come back to that later. All right, I'm glad. Okay, uh, so in any case, the key point is there's a clear prediction of the hot Big Bang model, and this is of extremely, maybe not of importance now, but historically, this was a huge debate, right? You know, is the hot Big Bang cosmology correct, or do you have some steady state model? And this is the proof. If you have the hot Big Bang model, you have a clear prediction that the afterglow. Uh, radiation 
from this primordial plasma should be released and should travel through the universe to our telescopes, okay? So we should see um, this radiation. Every time we look out in the night sky, we should you know, go out and we should look in the sky and we should be able to see a burning sea of fire because that's radiation from the sort of Big Bang plasma. Okay, so if I look in the sky, I should see the glow of the primordial plasma, right? Because the light has to be released. So this is an obvious question, but why, you know, hopefully when you go out at night, you don't see a burning sea of fire in the sky. Why do I not see that? Obvious question. That's right. So we talked about how the, you know, the energy of the photon is proportional to 1 over A. Uh, the, the wavelength stretches from redshift 1100 to today by a factor of 1,000. And when the CME is emitted, it, it looked very much like the surface of the sun, right? That was a similar kind of temperature and uh, you know, similar black body spectrum. But that gets now redshift, that gets redshifted uh, to microwave frequencies. Okay, and so you need to build specialized microwave telescopes with lots of effort to be able to see this cosmic microwave background, or you can just get lucky like uh, these people did. Um, that's completely unfair. Uh, they did an amazing job. I'm sure you've all heard these stories of Penzias and Wilson, how they built this telescope to do astronomy and test communication equipment. And you've all heard the story of how just by being really careful experimenters, they, uh, you know, they, they tracked this down. They found an excess signal that eventually they concluded has to be real. Right? And then it w the Princeton group helped them to interpret this as the cosmic microwave background, the prediction of the hot Big Bang. So right, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard these stories right, where they tried everything they could possibly try. And you know, at some point, they even climbed in and removed the pigeon droppings from their experiment because they couldn't explain this mysterious you know, thermal radiation. But even that didn't get rid of it. And you know, eventually, they were convinced this is real. So I, I've, I always heard this story, but at some point I came across what I think is kind of a dark side to this story, and it probably shows just how upset they were getting at their, at their telescope not working, which is they didn't just clean the pigeon droppings. The, the, one of them went out and shot all the pigeons, which I think is just uh, kind of illustrates just how frustrated they must have been getting at these, their telescope not working. Um, in any case, this was the proof that indeed, you know, the hot Big Bang happened. We can see its radiation, okay? We can see its afterglow, and that killed, you know, these steady state models almost entirely. Okay, so that is, well, I should say, though, that obviously you can't, it's not enough to just say, oh, I found some radiation. You need to prove it is cosmic microwave background radiation, and one really good way of doing this is showing that it is a black body, right? A nearly perfect black body, okay? because that's what you'd expect from a glowing plasma. All right, so if you measure this, that is then the definitive proof that uh, this is radiation coming from the hot Big Bang. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the Kobe fire ass measurement, one of the most amazing uh, experiments uh, you know, in cosmology where the error bars have to be magnified by a factor of around 200 so that you can even see them on this plot. So uh, this, Kobe fire ass experiment showed that the CMB is actually, I think to my knowledge, the most perfect black body that you can find in nature. Now, if people know something else, you can feel free to correct me on that. And you know, you can ask how do they how can they measure it if they if it's the most perfect black body. So it's kind of an interesting experimental question, but unless people are interesting, I won't go into that. In any case, that was the confirmation that this is the CMB. We found this background radiation. Okay, are there any questions about what the CMB is and the sort of background properties of the CMB before I move on to the fluctuations? Okay. All right, so our universe today is not perfectly uniform, but the CMB is almost perfectly uniform. Okay, and for some time, experimenters struggled to find variations in the CMB. In fact, they had already ruled out the levels that we find today due to some errors. So, you know, you can increase the contrast by a factor of 1,000. Maybe you see a dipole, but basically you cannot find fluctuations in the CMB temperature until you increase this contrast by the factor of around 100,000. 
But then you see them, okay? Then you see these beautiful measurements made by the Kobe DMR experiment, right? And this is sort of the first image of the, you know, almost primordial fluctuations that we can see in the CMB, right? And this is again showing the full sky unfurled in, into this lozenge. This is a, a map as a function of direction in the sky. And so some directions, the CMB is a little bit brighter, has a higher temperature, and some directions it's a little less bright, has a lower temperature. And so this is, you know, I think a, a really, really amazing observation, right? And, and just very much, it's one of the better Nobel Prizes, I think. Um, okay. It is, isn't it? I don't know. There's some other ones that are not so cool. Um, right. Okay, but of course, luckily, so, we didn't uh, stop at uh, I, Kobe. Uh, yep. Is the, there is a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, so it's asking um, if the universe uh, were still not expanding, would we expect to have received a different picture of the CMB? Um, well, right. So if it weren't expanding, was that? follow and if the universe keeps expanding in uh, larger scale times will we have different picture of CMB yeah um, so if the universe was not expanding in other words if the scale factor wasn't increasing with time there's no reason let's say it was static then there's no reason to think the past was dramatically different from today you wouldn't expect it to be you know at a temperature of many thousands of degrees Kelvin when it's at a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin today, right? So indeed, you would not expect this, right? You only expect that if the universe is evolving and has a very hot early phase uh, because it's so dense and small. Uh, and then the other question was, is the CMB evolving? Uh, and the answer is yes, right? So it's, as the scale factor continues to increase, the uh, CMB temperature will continue to fall and in fact, if, you know, we're kind of lucky because if we lived, I don't know how many hundreds of billions of years in the future, dark energy will have blown up the universe a lot and the energy density will be a lot lower. So it would be harder to observe, It'd have a much lower temperature. And the CMB patterns will also change with time, but on time scales of billions of years, although that depends on scales. Anyway, this, someone made a video how the CMB will evolve. If you want to see that, let me know and I can try to dig that out. In any case, okay, so after this Kobe discovery, um, we didn't stop, fortunately, but we built a successive series of better and better experiments going from Kobe to WMAP to Planck, okay? And the current state of the art, along with ground-based CMB experiments that, that I work on that I won't uh, talk about quite as much, uh, this is our current uh, best image of the cosmic microwave background fluctuations, the variations in uh, the brightness or the temperature across the sky, which I'll call theta, the fractional uh, difference in the CMB temperature as a function of where I looked. And obviously, orange is showing you regions that are a little bit higher in temperature and blue regions, directions in which the CMB is a little bit colder. And, you know, this is, I think, an amazing, amazing image. It's, it's a picture uh, of the universe as it looked 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Okay, so I'm going to start discussing a little bit what exactly it is we're looking at, and I'll finish that at the end of this lecture. Okay, so what are we looking at exactly, right? So just in terms of the background. Um, now, you probably are familiar with the concept of optical depth, tau, which is an integral over Ne sigma t. It sort of tells you the probability of scattering, and in particular, e to the minus tau is the probability that a photon has not scattered um, from a time eta to today. Okay, so if e to the minus tau is the probability of a photon not scattering, we can also use that to derive the probability of a photon last scattering at a certain time. And with a little bit of thought, you can convince yourself that that's basically the derivative of e to the minus tau, and therefore is given by this quantity minus tau dot e to the minus tau. 
which is called the visibility function. That's the probability that a photon lasts scattered at a time eta. Now here on the bottom is a plot of the visibility function versus uh, time or versus temperature. And you can see on the bottom is the visibility function. What's the probability of a photon last scattering at a certain time or redshift? And on the top, you can see the ionization fraction that we talked about with the Saha equation. And you see there's a big step, right? A big step here. And that corresponds to recombination and decoupling. And so there's a big derivative in, in tau there. And that explains why I had this spike in the visibility function. So from thinking about it a little bit, you conclude that the, most of the last scattering happens in a very narrow range of redshifts and times. So basically, photons last scatter you know, right after recombination, right near decoupling. Okay, there's a big spike, and usually we assume that to be if you want to do an approximate treatment of the CMB, you can assume this is basically a delta function. Right? It's a very sharp uh, peak in the visibility function. So it's called the visibility function because generally where photons last scatter, that's sort of how far you can see into a medium. Right? You can see maybe uh, one optical depth in. Okay, so what that means is that the, we're seeing, when we're looking at the CMB, we're effectively seeing a surface. Right? We're seeing a surface in both time and space 14 billion years in the past. And I think it's worth just trying to visualize this properly, because it'll be come in handy later when we're talking about CMB fluctuations. Okay, so just make sure you have a picture of what exactly it is we're seeing. So here's sort of a space-time diagram, but I've suppressed one spatial dimension, and instead I'm plotting time. Okay, so these are equal time slices through the universe. And I'm using conformal time, so photons travel at 45 degrees. So this is early on. The, the universe is an opaque plasma. Photons are rapidly scattering. And then the universe cools and cools and cools. And at one time, at one temperature, redshift around 1100, suddenly from everywhere, these photons can stream, free stream. Okay? So they're released all at the same time in every direction. But the photons we see define a surface. Right? So we only see photons that were released from you know, 14 billion years ago, uh, basically 14 billion light years away, effectively. Right? So the ones that are uh, going to end up exactly at our point in space time when we're observing today. Uh, yeah? So if they were released um, according to the temperature of the final locus, yep. this surface would be like, sorry, it wouldn't be flat. Yeah, that is actually going to be the answer. So we'll come, good job. We'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, so this is the picture you should have. Effectively, we are, uh, you should have this picture that we're sort of seeing a surface when the CMB photons were released that's very far away, but it's also, of course, 14 billion years in the past. Right? So you're seeing back along a light cone and uh, what you're seeing is sort of the, the intersection of that constant time or constant temperature surface with that light cone. Okay, does that make sense? It's a little confusing in cosmology always to think about, uh, you know, to think about us visualizing things along the light cone, but we're seeing things far away, therefore we have to be seeing them far into the past. This is what we're seeing when we're looking at the CMB. It's a shell around us 14 billion years in the past. Okay? Uh, yep. As you speak, you, uh, which you saw, wasn't exactly the, like, in the like delta function, yep. but rather uh, spread. Yep. Does it have any impact? I mean, it's not yep. uh, exactly a surface? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does, right? So, in fact, as you're saying, Play. there's some. Yep. Can, can you repeat the question for oh, those sorry, yeah, of course. Uh, so, the question is. I talked about the visibility function being strongly peaked, but it's not exactly a delta function. It has some width. Does that do anything? And indeed, it will do things to the observables that we're measuring. So probably the most prominent effect of the fact that this kind of this surface is not 
exactly flat, it has some width, is the fact that very small fluctuations kind of get blurred out. Okay, so if I have a very small fluctuation, that gets blurred out. And that's one of the reasons the C and B power spectrum is cut off. There's also another one, which is diffusion, but that's, they contribute similar amounts, roughly. So, you know, it's hard to see tiny fluctuations because I'm sort of integrating over a finite width. Uh, yep. What's that? Uh, so, yeah, I think that that is effectively true, right? It'll be increasingly difficult. To, uh, just the energy will fall so low, and um, yeah, so so that is that is certainly true. In fact, if you have w less than minus one, that'll happen in a finite time. You won't, you won't be able. To, uh, everything will be thrown apart. So uh, yes. Question. Okay, yep, that's, as, as long as I can go over a little bit, I probably take as many questions. Uh, I, I, can you repeat? Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is if I have dark energy, do I see sort of, uh, well, will it be increasingly hard to see the CMB? That was sort of the question, right? So, since the CMB in that later time will be coming from more faster distance, but that will go beyond the ability. Yeah, I think that's right. So, the sort of co moving horizon will sort of shrink, right? And so, we won't, we won't, be able to see as, uh, yeah, as far, just like inflation, right? You're sort of zooming into so a patch. The the CMB would have already crossed, crossed uh, yeah, so, sorry, say that again? I didn't quit. Uh, for example, if you are looking at the surface, yep. so if, uh, if you are looking at it from 100 years later, yep. so technically we should see from the uh, distance faster from us, so that, that circle corresponding to the cone will be some outer. Yeah, so, so you have to be careful about distinguishing then between the sort of the particle horizon versus the, uh, the co-moving Hubble radius, and those will give you slightly different answers. So if you think about the co-moving Hubble radius, it does look like it's shrinking, but of course, actually, we have information. You know, we don't lose information that we had in the past, and so we can actually perceive. So there's some subtleties there. I have to think about this, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, good, all right, let's move on. But let's look at this now from the top. I'm gonna stop plotting uh, this time coordinate. I'm always just gonna plot sort of x, y, and you should remember that this surface is, f is 14 billion years in the past, and we are in the middle looking at this today, okay? So there's a shell around us, and it's looking far away, but it's also looking far into the past. Okay, now I wanna try to describe quantitatively what, uh, we are seeing, and then I, and I want us to be able to understand and derive the CMB power spectrum. But before we can make things quantitative, we need to introduce the relevant machinery that I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I'll just remind you about the machinery used to compute a power spectrum, what is the power spectrum, et cetera. So let's quantify the information in this CMB anisotropy field. So again, we have a pattern of hot and cold spots. And currently, our theories, and there's good reasons for this, do not predict the exact realization. They don't predict the exact distribution of hot and cold spots. You could say that's due to symmetries or because our theories are quantum mechanical. But instead, what we need to do to quantitatively describe this CMB anisotropy pattern is describe it statistically in terms of variances and uh, correlation functions and things like this. Okay, and that's what our theories can robustly predict. Now, before I talk about spherical harmonics, I wanna just consider a small cutout, a small two-dimensional cutout of the CMB, because then, every, then I can assume what's called the flat sky approximation, okay, that it's a small cutout of the CMB last scattering surface, I can just use Fourier transforms, and then everything is really simple. Okay, so let's start by looking at this small 2D cutout of the CMB and assume uh, that this is flat, and then I can describe this field using the two-point correlation function psi, which is the average of the temperature at a point x 
multiplied by the, by the temperature at a point x prime averaged over realizations of the universe. Okay? Now, one thing that we have to, that we assume just due to homogeneity and isotropy for our correlators, our two point correlator, for example, is that there's no difference between the correlator in this direction or another direction. So basically, there's a translation invariance in this uh, statistical quantity. The CMB should be the same statistically in that direction and in this other direction. And so what that means is that two-point correlator has to have a translation invariance. They have to be able to move it by an arbitrary vector A and still get the same answer. Now, what does that mean for the Fourier modes of this field? So I'm going to take this temperature map, theta of x, or theta is a function of where I'm looking, and I'm going to Fourier transform it, and I'm just going to write that as theta of L. I'm not going to write any tildes on it. Whenever there's a Fourier index, you should just be clear this is the Fourier mode. So I'm going to Fourier transform that and ask what does this translation invariance imply for the Fourier coefficients? So one, one second. Right? So what I can do is I can take that correlation function, write it in terms of this, uh, these Fourier modes using the sort of two Fourier transforms, and then I can say I want this to be unchanged by translating by a vector A. Okay, so how do I translate by a vector A? I add A to X and X prime. Now in general, that's going to change the answer, right? For general phi of, uh, theta of L, theta of L prime, that's going to change the answer. The only way that translation is not going to introduce an additional phase factor is if I impose that this, that L prime is equal to minus L. And in other words, the only way I can have this symmetry is if these two Fourier modes are proportional to this delta function. Okay, so translation invariance requires this delta function, and the prefactor is the CMB power spectrum. Okay, so effectively it tells you the variance as a function of L, as a function of which Fourier mode you're looking at. Sorry, there was a question? Yeah? Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat the translation mean you're imposing uh, because of observation uh, constraints? No, so, well, I guess it work, works sort of both ways. We sort of assume one of the foundational assumptions in, in building up quantitative cosmology is that, you know, are, we're not special and that there's no special point and no special direction. So we assume sort of the cosmological principle of homogeneity and isotropy, and we just sort of assume that has to hold for correlators that we can write down. Right? Obviously, though, for isotropy at least, this is something we can test extremely well, and so far all tests, you know, with a few asterisks, have passed extremely well. Right? So we, we have tested this, and it does work. Uh, sorry. Uh, I should repeat the question. There was a, there was a question about, uh, you know, why can we assume this translation invariance? And, you know, it's, it, to some extent, it's a foundational question. Yeah, right, you heard my answer already. Okay, uh, good. Let's move on. This is the power spectrum. It's basically just the square of a Fourier mode. But now, Fourier modes are not good to describe a sphere, right? They're good to describe a flat uh, surface. But if we want to describe the full sphere, we need to use better basis functions. We can't use Fourier modes. Instead, we need to use spherical harmonics. But the ideas are exactly the same. Right? Just like I uh, can expand a field in terms of Fourier coefficients, I can expand a field theta in terms of spherical harmonics. And instead of Fourier modes, I have spherical multiple coefficients, ALM. And I can use the fact that these spherical harmonics, which hopefully you're familiar with from, for example, quantum mechanics, are orthonormal over the sphere to figure out what all of the spherical multiple coefficients are, okay? Just by multiplying uh, by a spherical harmonic and, and integrating over all directions, I do what's called a spherical harmonic transform. And again, just like in flat sky, this sort of translation or rotation invariance imposes these delta functions, just like I had for translation invariance on the flat sky. So this is the definition then of the power spectrum. Effectively, it's just the square of a mode or the variance as a function of which multiple I'm looking at. 
Now, unfortunately, we don't have access to an infinite ensemble of universes that we can run over and over and over again and average ALM and A star LM. Instead, we have one universe and we can compute an estimate of the power spectrum by just taking the ALMs that we have, assuming that due to rotational invariance, all the M modes are statistically the same and averaging over all of these M modes. So this is an estimator for the power spectrum and that's the best we can do because we just have one universe. But it's an estimate of a variance with a finite number of samples. There's some error I just can't get around. Right? So that's what's called the cosmic variance error. All right. Let me give you a little bit more intuition about the power spectrum. Like if I show you a power spectrum, you should be able to have some feeling for what it means. Okay? And basically the power spectrum is telling you, you know, how strong the fluctuations are as a function of the angular scale that I'm considering. Okay? So the standard CMB power spectrum, again, it plots how strong the fluctuations are as a function of multiple or what scale I'm considering with large scales on the left at low L and small scales on the right at high L. And as I'm sure you know, this standard CMB power spectrum has a peak. And that peak reflects the fact that in the map, there's a characteristic size of the spots. These spots are around a degree, typically. And that's the peak of this power spectrum. But if I had a map with a lot smaller structures in it, then that power spectrum would have a peak at higher L on smaller scales. And if I have a map with huge blobs in it, very large scale features, then that power spectrum will peak at low L which corresponds to larger scales. Okay, so does that intuition make sense? I'm quantifying how strong the fluctuations are as a function of scale, and that's how I can describe this map. And because the CMB is very close to Gauss Gaussian, this contains nearly all of the information. Any questions about that? Okay, hopefully you've seen this all before. And what happens if you go out and measure it? You get this beautiful plot that will be our goal to explain. This is one of the current best measurements of the CMB power spectrum with the Planck experiment, right? And it's amazing, again, just how good these measurements are. You can't even see the error bars for these, uh, these band powers of the CMB power spectrum, right? So first of all, this is amazing, number one, because the measurements are, are fantastic. But the other reason this is an amazing plot is because of this red line. And what this red line, is basically our current theoretical model for what the CMB power spectrum should look like. And it contains only a small number of free parameters. This isn't a function with huge number of parameters that we can fit. It only contains you know, the matter, it contains basically the density, a few density parameters and a few initial conditions. Six parameters, and you're able to fit many, you know, thousands of degrees of freedom at sub, sub percent precision accuracy. So this is a real triumph for theoretical cosmology as well as experiment. And so our goal will be to explain and at least give you a, an, a, a reasonable understanding of why this red line and why this power spectrum looks the way it does. Okay. So there are several steps that we need to go through in order to understand this CMB power spectrum. First, we're going to try to understand how photons propagate in a perturbed universe. Then we're going to talk about the initial conditions. And finally, we'll talk about the evolution of these initial conditions forward in this primordial plasma to give us the perturbations in the density of radiation and potential, et cetera, that uh, we see in the cosmic microwave background. So let's start. We're going to start today by discussing how photons propagate in the CMB to us. OK, are there any questions about this plan? Propagation, initial conditions, evolution. That's what we need to understand. And then we should completely know why the CMB looks the way it does. All right? Uh, any questions? All right. Let's talk about CMB photon propagation and the basics of the anisotropy. All right. So there yep. is 
So the, the question is why the measurements do not explain so well the predictions in the power spectrum at large scale? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the question is, I think, basically about this dip here, right? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, statistically, this is a totally acceptable fit. You know, you get a very good chi-squared to lambda CDM. And so, you know, it's tempting to just wait to just say, well, this is a posteriori statistics. There's some fluctuation, and you're looking by eye for features that look weird. But when you have so many data points, there's going to be a few things that look, look strange. So, you know, overall, this is a very good fit. And, you know, this is not, yeah, this is maybe not too surprising. But I, I kind of agree. It does look intriguing. Um, so it might be worth thinking about more. And I'm, you know, I think there have been some proposals for interesting phenomenology that could explain this. The, the issue with these low L modes is that we only, you know, we can't get, we only have a small number of low L modes, right? As I mentioned, uh, you know, the number of modes is, the number of M modes is basically the numbers of samples of that variance that we have in our universe. And we only have a small number of samples for these low multiples. So you know, there's not much better. We can't measure these much better than we can today. Potentially, there's some room for you know, improving measurements with large scale structure, but that's very hard. So yeah, it's a good question how you could test phenomena, you know, theories that just modify the low Ls. So, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question, right? So um, I talked Tiny. earlier about, oh, sorry. Why do the error bars depend so strongly on L, right? So I think there are, there are a few factors here. One of them is we're trying to estimate the true variance from a finite number of samples, okay? And the number of samples I have is the number of M modes per L, which is 2L plus 1. So naturally, at higher L, 2L, you know, I have more samples. And so I get a smaller cosmic variance error. That's one reason, and that's actually the main reason here that the error bars shrink. Okay, so I just have more uh, modes for each L, and that's, I have more samples, I get a better estimate of the variance. Now, th there are also other effects. For example, here, you see they get bigger again. That is because the Planck noise, there's instrument noise in the Planck detectors, and there's a, a finite beam, and those sort of together cause the, uh, the error bars to, to increase again at higher L. So if I went to even higher L, just the experiment limitation would give me a blow up in error bars. Okay? Uh, there is another question okay. in the chat asking about the relation between L and the scales. Right. Uh, why so, do we say low L corresponds to larger scales? Right, so I mean, if you're familiar with Fourier transforms, sorry, the question, sorry, you, you read it. You read the question, I good. Um, so I have to think about all these technology. Um, so yeah, basically you're familiar in, with Fourier transforms how you know, there's an inverse relationship between sort of wave number and wave length, right? It's like two pi over lambda. And it's exactly the same in the correspondence between multiple, which is like wave number, and angle, which is like wavelength, okay? So there's a sort of a Fourier inverse relationship, if you will. That's, that's one way to imagine it. Um, you could say, why don't we do this correlation function in real space? The translation invariance has a nice property that means that these different measurements are independent. That delta function means different L's are independent, and I don't have to have a measurement where all the data points are correlated in some funny way that's very hard to understand. Okay, so again, we want to understand this power spectrum. Why does it look the way it does? We'll talk today about photon propagation. And really, this is a, a nice calculation, and it's worth paying attention to this, because it tells you what exactly we're seeing in the CMB. When you look at that CMB picture, what exactly are you looking at? All right, so how can we compute the propagation of the photons from the last scattering surface to today? Well, we need to relate the CMB to the conditions on the last scattering surface and the conditions on the way. And so how we do this is the following. We first start off by writing down the metric in a perturbed universe, 
So the differences in density in the perturbed universe cause changes to the space-time distances. And you can see the metric is then modified if I choose a Newtonian gauge perturbation, and I assume that anisotropic stress is negligible, I can describe these perturbations to the metric by just a Newtonian perturbation phi, okay, that affects both the spatial and the time part of this metric. Okay, so that's how I'm going to describe using perturbation theory in my perturbed universe, which is clumpy. What is the trajectory of a photon to first order in these perturbations through that perturbed universe? Okay, so just to remind you of how we do this, you want to describe your trajectory in terms of a parameter lambda. The way this is done in general relativity is that for a massive particle, the particle path is determined such that the you know, proper space-time distance is minimized, and this gives you the geodesic equation. Right? I'm sure you're all familiar with this and these Christoffel symbols that make everything coordinate invariant. And for photons, it's convenient to rewrite this in terms of momenta. And this is the geodesic equation that we can then apply to momenta. There's obviously much more rigorous ways of deriving this. Okay, so if we want to compute the photon's path in GR, we need to evaluate the geodesic equation that describes the photon's trajectory. Now, this is written in terms of the four momentum components, but we would like to relate this to sort of physical quantities that we can actually measure, like the energy that we measure using our detectors. Okay, and in special relativity, I can, I note that the energy is given by P nu u nu, where u nu is the, the, four, the four velocity, that's an invariant, and I can just carry that invariant over to general relativity, except now my four velocity is not given by just one zero zero zero, but instead that derivative of the, um, the zero component with respect to uh, proper time is given by this slightly modified expression, and so, you know, this is, you don't need to know these details, but basically, the energy is given by the zero component of the four momentum, and there's a slight complication, this one minus phi over A due to the perturbation. Okay, so if we want to know how the energy of the photon evolves, which is what's relevant for determining the temperature, we just need to evaluate this geodesic equation for the zero component of the four momentum. Okay, now I'm not going to walk you through this. If you want to go through this, I can sort of show you how to do it, and I'll, I'll point you to some, I'll give you some hints, et cetera. So if you really like calculations and you really like evaluating Christoffel symbols, let me know. You're welcome to do that. I'm just going to not crunch through this, this, uh, this calculation. I will just give you the answer once you plug in all the Christoffel symbols, et cetera. You get this differential equation, okay, that describes how the energy evolves along the photon's path. So time derivative, this is a total derivative of the log of AE with respect to conformal time is given by the total derivative of the potential perturbation with respect to uh, conformal time plus two times the partial derivative of phi with respect to conformal time. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate along the photon's path. The photon is emitted and it travels to us. So I integrate from emission to us. And what I get, uh, just doing this integral from emission to us, is this expression. I can then tailor expand this exponential because these perturbations are small. And I get this expression relating the energy of the photon today to the energy of the photon when it's emitted. And the scale factor of the photon when it's emitted. And these perturbations. I'm just going to add by hand but it's easy to justify this, the fact that I've assumed that everything is emitted at rest. If the last scattering surface is moving towards us, the energy is affected by a factor, by this additional term, minus n dot b. Right? If it's traveling towards me, it gets a boost in energy, and if it's traveling away, it gets a decrement in energy. Okay, I told you earlier, we discussed earlier, that the energy of a photon and the temperature um, evolve in the same way, and so I can just take a ratio of the energy today 
divided by the energy at emission, and that's just given by the temperature I observe divided by the temperature at emission. So now I know almost everything. I know how the temperature I observe depends on the temperature at emission, which is always fixed. It's always 0.3 electron volts. And it's all written in terms of things I can, I know what they are. I know what the potentials at emission are. I know what the potential today is. I know what the velocity means. And I'll talk about this term in a second. The one thing I don't know in this expression is what the scale factor is when the CMB photon is emitted. Right, so we said it's emitted at a fixed temperature, but what scale factor does that correspond to? What is the scale factor, what is the redshift, when this photon is emitted? And it's not enough to take the average one. Well, we said earlier, this was the quiz question that I asked, that it has to be emitted at the same local temperature of 0.3 electron volts. But if I have an overdensity, then the universe has to cool a little bit longer to reach that 0.3 electron volts. And so it's emitted at a slightly bigger scale factor. Okay, so the time when it's emitted has to be a little bit different if I have more radiation in, that, in, in a certain region. So that's, some, that's kind of the, the physical reason why it can be emitted at the same local temperature, but I'm still sensitive to the radiation perturbation. It's because if I have a lot of radiation, it has to, the universe has to expand for longer to cool to the right temperature, and it's emitted later. Okay, so let's make this quantitative. What you can show is that if I have a radiation density perturbation delta r or delta rho r over rho r bar, then the scale factor of emission is not the sort of average one, but it's a bit bigger. It's emitted a bit later because the universe has to cool just a little bit extra. Now, you can work out exactly um, why that's the case. So basically what you do is you assume that the temperature at emission is the same. And that has to be given by the perturbed radiation density and time just as much as it's given by the unperturbed radiation density and time. So the radiation density always ha and the temperature has to be the same at emission. And so these perturbations to the time of emission and the radiation density of emission have to cancel because it has to be emitted at the same local temperature given just by this nice recombination and decoupling physics. Okay? All right, and if I do a Taylor expansion of this, these perturbations have to cancel. I can do some rearrangement to figure out the time delay this causes and, uh, and plug that in to a Taylor expansion of the, the scale factor with time, and then I get this expression. Okay? But again, to emphasize the physics here, if I have more radiation, if I have a perturbation in radiation density, the universe has to cool for longer. It's emitted at a larger scale factor. And therefore, it experiences less redshifting along its path to us. Okay? So where we have a higher density, the CMB is emitted later with a larger scale factor, giving us less redshift, and that's why we see a temperature fluctuation. That's the physics. Okay, let's put this all together. Putting this all together, this is an important expression. This tells us what we're seeing in the CMB, and it relates it to quantities on the last scattering surface and along the path of the photon. So if you haven't, if you lost the plot, now is the time to pay attention again. Okay, so the TM, CMB temperature anisotropy theta as a function of direction depends on the radiation density perturbation evaluated on the last scattering surface in the direction I'm looking. So if I'm looking in that direction, it depends on the radiation density perturbation at that point on the last scattering surface and at the time that corresponds to emission. And similarly, it depends on, we just explained why that is, it depends on the, uh, these terms, which I'll walk you through. So we just talked about the fact that the density perturbation causes you to get less redshifting and a temperature increase. Now that second term, I think, makes a lot of sense. If the photon is emitted on the last scattering surface from a region where there's a potential perturbation, let's say there's a potential well, that photon has to lose energy to climb out of the potential well. And therefore, 
it's redshifted and I have a negative temperature fluctuation. On the other hand, if it's emitted from you know, a maximum of the potential, it actually gains energy and I see a higher temperature. Okay, that makes complete sense. Finally, uh, yeah? Say again? Why this potential is not connected for an interactive after it goes out? So I think, are you talking about this diagram? This might not be the most ideal diagram. You could just draw a, a hill and then it's falling down the hill. Is that what you mean or did I misunderstand? Well, but it, it's, it's emitted from sort of inside the potential well at a fixed energy, right? So, so that's, you know, it doesn't, it hasn't fallen in. It's emitted from the bottom of the potential well or from the top, right? So it's, it's because it comes from the potential well. It's not because it traverses it. Although, yeah, so, right. Uh, the question was why, you know, why doesn't it cancel out when it falls in and comes out? It's because it's emitted from in the potential well. Um, Although we will come back to your question in a, very, in a second. It's a very interesting uh, point. This third term is called the Doppler term. And I think it makes complete sense. If the last scattering surface is moving towards us, then I get a sort of Doppler boost to the energies of the photons. And I see a positive uh, temperature fluctuation. The last term is a little bit more subtle. And it's actually related to the question, uh, the point that was just made. So, Normally, if I have a potential well along the photon's path, that won't do anything because the photon will fall into the potential well and it'll gain some energy, but then it'll crawl right back out and it'll lose that energy again. Okay, so the blue shift thing falling in is completely canceled by the red shift crawling out. The only way that cannot be the case is if while the photon is traveling through the potential well, that potential well changes in amplitude, okay? So it, it decays or increases. In other words, that partial time derivative of the potential is non-zero. Okay, so then I can actually change the photon's energy. For example, if, if a photon sort of falls into this potential well, it gains a lot of energy, gets blue shifted, and then the potential well, you know, decays, becomes less shallow, it has to give up less energy than it gained. And so that can introduce a net uh, boost or decrement to, uh, to the CMB temperature in the direction of these decaying potentials. Now that's a pretty small effect usually, because normally during matter domination, the potentials are constant. But there are some regimes where this is important. And the first one is dark, dark energy domination at late times. Uh, dark energy, it's a non-clustering component. It causes the potentials to decay. And so this uh, late ISW, or integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, is one way that we have of testing dark energy, because we can sort of check whether the potentials decay the way dark energy says they should. There's also another, there's also an early uh, ISW effect, though, because the CMB is emitted during matter domination, but not long after radiation has stopped being important, right? So it's, it's not long after matter radiation equality. And so there's still a little bit of radiation around. And so there's also an early integrated Sachs-Wolf effect from the radiation causing the potentials to decay. OK? But that basically summarizes the meaning of all of these terms. I, when I look at a CMB temperature fluctuation, I see the sum of density perturbations that cause more or less redshifting due to the delays of emission, potential minima or maxima that cause me to lose or gain energy, a Doppler term which causes a Doppler booster uh, to the energy if the last scattering surface is moving, and this integrated Sachs-Wolf effect that we talked about. So hopefully you now understand what the CMB is and what exactly it is in terms of these perturbations you're seeing when we look at these beautiful images of the cosmic microwave background. And so in the next lecture, we will connect these perturbations here with the initial conditions and then go all the way to, from the initial conditions to a prediction of the CMB power spectrum. And that's all I have uh, for today.
Happy to take more questions, though. Yeah. Um. So we'll have a discussion session in half an hour, so perhaps we can oh, keep right. questions for the. Thank you, and see you in half an hour.